There's always something wrong with the address that's listed for me because I'm actually a professor at Heidelberg University, but Heidelberg University has two medical faculties, one of which is in Mannheim, which is where I'm working. Uh, maybe with respect to the question that had been asked, the way I got involved with this ZIP initiative is that I was the president of the German Pain Society in 2010, and we were among the, by now, 180 groups that contributed to this process, and I uh, was involved in drafting the ZIP document and uh, drafting the roadmap uh, towards uh, better pain relief in Europe. So. You can see here that several organizations are involved. My left hand neighbors are also representing the country and will probably uh, tell you a little bit of, about that background too. So clearly it's uh, not just one European organization, EFIC, that is running this, but EFIC by its very nature is already kind of a consortium of national societies. But this process of society impact of pain goes far beyond that, including really a broad spectrum and we we like to think that we include everybody who is relevant <laughs> because it's such a large number and it includes patients, organizations, and at very many different levels. So maybe this is the beginning. Um, so we were talking in the first focus group about uh, quality indicators. And this relates in the context of the roadmap to one of the two dimensions that we have that has a European level. So the first five are very, very important. They are being dealt with at a national level to come up with awareness programs, to improve education, to improve research, and all sorts of things at a national level. That's probably the most important part, but it has to be done in the different nations. And then Belgium, of course, is one of those nations. However, in Europe, we have this unique situation that we also have an umbrella, which is the European Union. And uh, as Professor Kress has already mentioned, this really s the its decisive event, I think, was in 2011, when we really had a good meeting where we had representatives of the Parliament, um, of the Commission, and uh, the Council that got involved into this topic. And the, the unique situation we have here is that we can try to do something at the European level. The, the aim that you can see here is that we think that pain management can contribute to improve the quality of life throughout Europe. So the focus group that I was involved with yesterday looked at indicators that could be used to, to compare where we stand now, where we stand in the future, to monitor how we make progress at the European level, not the national level, just at the European level. And here we have basically two aims. The larger aim is that we're convinced that when you improve pain management, that this clearly is a major indicator for a healthcare system in general. Professor Sakres had already mentioned the immense quantitative importance that pain has for the people who are affected, but also for the healthcare system cost uh, levels. So we think that if you have improvements there, this will be a parameter for a healthcare system in general. However, we had a much closer focus now to be more precise. So when we think that pain management is important, the first thing we have to look at is can we measure improvements in pain management? And then the implication we think will be that this will improve the healthcare system in general. So we focused on what we think is the biggest problem that we have there, chronic pain. This is not to say that acute pain is not important. Actually, the transition from acute to chronic is probably where the most important progress can be made. But clearly, the big problem that exists is uh, the chronic pain, in particular when it's not related to cancer. Because in the cancer field, lots of efforts are already being made, and the palliative care groups are very active in this field also. So what we're focusing on is chronic non-cancer pain. And I think I should use the plural, because there are many different chronic non-cancer pains, in rheumatological disorders, in neurological disorders, back pain, and so forth and so on. So it's a large variety. Participants yesterday that were not pain specialists were actually quite impressed with the large variety of situations that can lead to a chronic pain problem. So we started with, with a pilot 
uh, project in Spain. We had a group of experts from a number of countries that then came up with a suggestion that we could look at. And then yesterday we had some 40 or 50 uh, people with interest in this field, pain specialists and non-specialists alike, that discussed on these indicators. And the outcome is relatively humble because it's not a final document that we present to you that is the list of indicators that everybody should use now. Um, we have three types of indicators that should be looked at and we spend a lot of time discussing on the first one and the third one. And I would like to go into a little bit of detail there. So the starting point of indicators should be structural indicators. They are relatively easy to measure, for example, we talked about pain management as a priority, so it's relatively easy to go through the documentation in the country and see whether it has been declared as a priority. So some of the countries have been leading this, uh, in particular France, Portugal and Italy. But for example, a few years ago in the UK, it was officially declared a priority and clearly we can see that there's progress once a country healthcare system has declared pain management a priority, then a process is set into action that will lead to progress. So this is one of the dimensions. Educational programs so that we educate people to become pain specialists and to educate healthcare professionals that they know about pain is an important factor. And also what we identified yesterday is the existence of guidelines, condition specific guidelines. So chronic back pain guidelines, nerve pain guidelines, osteoarthritis guidelines, and so further and so on. They are very important indicators. The very existence is a structural indicator. Then where uh, the music will play is really process indicators. And this list is very incomplete right now because uh, of local and country specific uh, factors that involve this. But the side that we set is on the outcome. So we start with some structural starting points which are necessary but not sufficient conditions. We need to uh, implement processes that can be very different according to the country. But whether the process is good or not ultimately depends on whether it changes outcome. And here the uh, discussion yesterday was quite clear. We have on one hand pain relief as an outcome. And then we have what could be called either quality of life or functioning as another outcome. And Dr. Gua already showed this in a survey of uh, goals that doctors declare when they treat patients with chronic pain. These are the two things that, that stand out. Clearly pain has to be reduced one way or the other. And the functioning in everyday life of the patient has to be improved also. And this leads to an important other issue this uh, outcome quality indicator list is probably the same for all chronic conditions. So uh, when we talk about outcome indicators and want to improve functioning, people who talk about, let's say, cancer treatment, cardiovascular disorder treatment, stroke treatment, whatever, they also talk about functioning. So clearly, uh, functional outcome indicators are a very important set. One set that is available, it's called the EQ5D because it has five dimensions. It has been used in, in the UK, not in Germany, but in, in some of the countries, this is a tool that has been used. And it's quite educational if you want to look up their website. You will notice that one of the five dimensions that has been developed for, for all conditions is pain or discomfort. So clearly it works both ways. So when we, we come from the pain field, our goal is not just to relieve pain, but to improve the everyday situation of the patient. When people who treat other conditions look at the overall situation of the patients, they recognize immediately that pain or other discomforts are one of the important five dimensions. So this, these two parts, that we have a list of structural indicators that are the starting point, relatively ready to measure a number of pain specialists, education programs, and things like that, and we can agree on what the important outcome parameters are that involve pain relief but also everyday function and probably 
in a way that would apply to any <coughs> disease that we talk about, then we can start looking at processes. These processes in the pain field would be that we need to have a multimodal treatment approach, that we have to improve the wait time so that speed plays a role. We know that there is a transition from acute to chronic. Time is not the only factor, but time is one important factor. So if we can speed up the process, this would be of benefit. Um, there are some benchmarking programs that will be discussed later today that have shown that if you invest early in the treatment of a patient, that you will benefit later. The patient will benefit, but also your healthcare system benefits from saving costs that would occur later. And uh, with respect to guidelines, uh, one thing that I'm involved with in Germany is we are producing high-level guidelines, evidence-based, wonderful guidelines, but the next step will be how are they implemented? Do these processes really reach the patient? So implementation of good guidelines will certainly be one of the process indicators that will be used. And it's not just a pain. There cannot be a pain <coughs> guideline in general because there are so different so many different types of chronic pain that have to be done. And this is basically the take home message from focus group one. So the document that uh, I think you have in your materials was the starting point for a discussion yesterday. We made a lot of progress on the structure indicators and outcome indicators, which we are confident that with some expert help of a task force of EFIC, we can probably finalize in the near future. And then it's back to the individual countries to come up with processes that they can influence, identify process indicators for the specific processes, and then ultimately look at the outcome for the citizens. Here.